。哎，大家好啊！刚才很抱歉遇到了一些这个技术问题啊。呃，我是来自谷歌的工程师，我叫刘硕。呃，这次非常呃荣幸的到上海来给大家做演讲。呃，这是我的这个 co-speaker， 呃 ，John George is from、uh, Cisco， 你忘了？ I'm Jono,、uh, like technically from Cisco. I'm working in Kubeflow related. Okay, so I'll speak to you in English now.、Um, so today's agenda,、uh, we're going to introduce、uh, hyperparameter tuning, and、uh, we'll be、uh, briefly covering wh、uh, what it is and why it's hard. And、uh, we'll go into our main topic, which is、uh, Kubeflow and Catup, and we'll see how these systems will、uh, help us do hyperparameter tuning. And、uh, we'll give a brief talk about the system architecture and the workflows. And we'll also show a quick demo of our system. And、uh, th then we'll uh, go into uh, uh, neural architecture search, which is a new area of、uh, research and implementation that、uh, CATIP has done. And finally, we'll go into some、uh, future work. So, what is、uh, hyperparameter tuning? So, let's start with an example.、Right. Suppose that we're doing this.、Uh, This is a very basic、uh, machine learning program for recognizing digits, right? So on the right-hand side, you can see uh, uh, some training code, and in fact,、uh, right on the bottom there, you can see that、uh, this is where we're we're starting to fit a model, right? So hyperparameters are the parameters that you set before the training process begins. So if you look at this list, we have you know, network, batch size,、uh, number of epochs, the learning rate, and so on.、Right? So these are the Parameters that are, that are、uh, that governing the training process. They're external to the training model. Right. This is、uh, in contrast to、uh, model parameters, which is、uh, learned by the, your training.、Okay. Uh, so yeah. So hyperparameters, configuration variables that are external to the model, and they're set before the training begins. And、um, so setting the right parameters can really significantly improve your model performance. But、uh, it's only if you do it correctly, which、uh, can be very difficult. So hyperparameter tuning is a process of finding optimal values for hyperparameters such that your objective function,、uh, in the previous case, that is our、uh, function to predict uh, digits, uh, handwritten digits, you want to maximize the prediction accuracy.、Okay. So why is that hard? Well, first of all. Uh, if you increase your number of hyperparameters and your hyperparameter ranges,、uh, the search space becomes exponentially large.、Right? So in the previous slides, we've seen about six or seven parameters. So imagine if you have a more complicated model, right? And you, your、um, your your space is just going to grow. So tuning by hand is really inefficient, and it's very、uh, prone to errors. And、um, you want to, in order to really track your Performance from one configuration to another. You want to、uh, track metrics across multiple jobs, so that means you have to have some kind of a data storage, some kind of a visualization、uh, interface, right? To 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 see what the, your experimentation has done.、Uh, maybe you want to anchor on some particular value for one parameter, like the batch size, and you see what changes when you adjust the learning rate, right? So you need to be able to track metrics. And also, you need to be able to manage resources and infrastructure.、Right. So, training jobs sometimes they require additional,、uh, maybe maybe additional hardware, some computing resources.、Uh, so, you want to be able to allocate and、uh, to provision and to clean up the resources. And uh, uh, finally, uh, there's a lot of、uh, different frameworks and algorithms to support. Right, for example,、uh, just from training, the example that we've seen is for MXNet. But、uh, you can have a TensorFlow or PyTorch model,、uh, and algorithms. There could be a grid search or、uh, a random search for Bayesian optimization and so on.、Right. So there, there are lots of different, uh, uh, a variety of、uh, similar problems. So,、uh, how does、uh, Kubernetes help us? So, first of all, Kubernetes makes it really easy for you to build microservices. So microservices are、uh, self-contained and lightweight services that do、uh, one thing really well, and、uh, Kubernetes also、uh, makes containerization easy with、uh, Docker.、Right. So、uh, the good thing is that really applies to our model of、uh, parallel training jobs, right? 
Yes, uh, jobs, we can uh, containerize them, and this makes them very easily scalable. And uh, this also helps our system uh, build up resilience, right? Uh, because uh, Kubernetes provides uh, auto healing and, uh, auto, uh, and uh, recovery uh, options. So uh, it's, it's uh, meaning that the failures of a particular training container, is, it won't affect the whole system, and the system can actually uh, automatically bring it back up. Okay? Uh, this also helps us with our uh, problem with uh, multiple uh, frameworks and uh, different uh, algorithms to support because uh, we could uh, create this uh, generic interface that's uh, interacting with uh, uh, the, al the algorithms as microservices. Right. So we'll go into uh, more details about that in a bit. And um, Kubernetes is also pretty good at uh, um, describing the desired state. Right. So we call those uh, declarative APIs versus uh, imperative, right? So this is the, uh, remember we talked about we want to manage resources, right? So this makes managing resources very easy because we just, all you need to do is describe the desired state uh, instead of uh, having to, to uh, write a complicated instructions on what you want to provision. Uh, Kubernetes has a very flexible API, meaning that we can extend the core API with custom resource definitions. So this allows us to interact with the objects using the standard REST APIs and tools like kubectl. And finally, Kubernetes is, is very portable. So uh, in production environments, we often have to deal with uh, different uh, environments, like uh, if you're doing local development uh, versus uh, uh, doing on-premise hosting or even moving to cloud. Right? Kubernetes has various options, but if you're built on top Kubernetes, your application should, should run everywhere where your Kubernetes cluster is deployed. So a little bit about uh, Kubeflow. So Kubeflow is a uh, Kubernetes native machine learning platform for developing, orchestrating, deploying, and running scalable end-to-end -end, uh, machine learning workloads. So that's that's quite of a uh, quite a mouthful, right? So if you look at this uh, diagram, and it's not to scale, but uh, uh, a lot of the problems with uh, building machine learning in the production deal, it deals with the, the things in the blue boxes, right? So monitoring service infrastructure, uh, ana analysis, processing management tools, and so on. Right? Your, M your machine learning core logic might be just only a small part of it. So Coolflow wants to make uh, building all the other stuff easier so you can concentrate on the core machine learning logic. And uh, so right now I'll turn over to John, who will go over us, uh, uh, introduce us to Catip. Hi everyone. Um, so let's talk about Catip. So Catip is the hyperparameter tuning component in Kubeflow. Um, it is uh, completely Kubernetes native, so that means you could install it even without Kubeflow. But then if you want to use features of Kubeflow, like the distributed training operators, then uh, it is advised to use within the Kubeflow ecosystem. So it is inspired from the Google VCA project. Uh, you would have read the paper. It, it's a black box tuner. Uh, you could, uh, the link is given in the, uh, in the below comment. You could read that. It's fully open source and it is framework agnostic. So which means you could use uh, your programs based on your choice. It could be written in TensorFlow, PyTorch, MXNet. You could just provide the images and it, it should start running. Um, it has a customizable algorithm backend. Uh, by default, it provides a random search, grid search, based in optimization hyperband. Uh, user could plug in uh, any algorithms based on their environment, and you don't need to even restart the components. It, it would be uh, started as a separate microservice, and uh, it should, uh, yeah, without even uh, restarting the component, it should start running. So let's talk about the concepts. The, f the first concept is experiment. So it's an end-to-end process for hyperparameter optimization. So for example, uh, take example of a digits recognition model. So you have to find the best hyperparameters for that. So that's the entire the experiment. The users provide experiment config and submit to CATIP. So it has uh, different sections. The, the important sections are one is objective, uh, which is what we are trying to optimize. 
for example, uh, for your model, uh, you want to optimize uh, accuracy, uh, and what you want to achieve is 99%. So the objective metric name is accuracy, and the value is 99%. The second is the search space, which is the constraints for configurations. So you could set limits for your parameters, say the max, maximum or the minimum. Or if it is categorically, you could set the list of options uh, that are valid for a particular option. And the last one is the search algorithm, which is how you find the optimal configurations. So in the last slide, as we said, uh, you could use the default ones or the ones uh, which is uh, added by the user. So like any other resource in Kubernetes, uh, experiment is also a resource. Uh, to be specific, it's a custom resource. So you could use all the standard APIs to uh, basically get, uh, create, and delete uh, the uh, experiment resource. Uh, you could use kubectl like any other resource in Kubernetes. And the state is stored in uh, Kubernetes database. And the lifecycle is managed by the Kubernetes controller pattern. The second one is suggestion. So once user submits uh, the experiment config uh, through Kubernetes API, the experiment controller picks it up and contacts the right suggestion service. So the suggestion is one proposed solution to optimization problem. So you have set the search space, and the suggestion is provided from the based on the uh, uh, settings given by the user, which is one proposed solution. Uh, uh, by the which is given by the suggestion service so each suggestions algorithm is a standalone microservice so which means you could add that during the runtime and it should not affect the already running experiment and it allows user to create customized uh, suggestion algorithms and the third one is the trial so once suggestions are provided by the suggestion service the trials are created by the experiment controller so trial is one iteration of the optimization process. So which means uh, once you get the parameter assignments or the suggestion, there's a worker process which actually starts running it and emits out the observation metrics. So similar to a trial, similar to experiment, trial is also a custom resource. And the experiment controller is the one which is spawning and managing the trials. And depending on the, the trial kind, uh, you can have the distributed job for it. So this is a basic workflow of the hyperparameter tuning. So uh, as I've said earlier, this is the one optimization loop. And this, this loop continues till one of these conditions are met. So either the objective value is reached, for example, or once your accuracy has reached 99%, or if uh, the budget has exhausted. So you could also set that my maximum number of trials to be run by this experiment is uh, x. So once x is reached, or when your objective is met, the optimization loop ends. Till that time, uh, the suggestions are created. And for the each suggestion, trial is, uh, trials are run, and the metrics are emitted. And these metrics are uh, collected, and new uh, suggestions are created. So this is a system architecture. So. Um, the user submits experiment, uh, and experiment controller is the Kubernetes uh, uh, custom controller. It picks it up and talks to the right suggestion through Captive Manager. Um, so uh, algorithm-related settings would have been given in the experiment. And once the experiment controller gets suggestions, it creates trials. The trial controller again picks it up and creates, starts executing trials and starts emitting metrics. The metric collector is a separate process, which again, uh, during the lifetime of trial, it uh, collects the metrics and writes to the data store. And this would be again used by the suggestions uh, for, the, for the future suggestions, and that loop continues. Um, yeah. Due to network, uh, we are not showing it live. But again, uh, we have a, a CATIB UI, which actually provides much of the features in the uh, as a user interface. But uh, for much, much more customizable options, it is better to use a command line at this point. But we are continuously refining it. So um, as I said, from the user point of view, what we have to do is setting the experiment config. And rest all, taken, uh, rest all is taken care by the uh, CATIB controller. 
Um, so uh, the things, the important sections that has to be filled would be uh, one is the name, the namespace uh, where the experiment has to be run. Uh, the next section is the common set of parameters. One is the parallel trial count, um, which basically says how many number of concurrent trials have to be run. So based on your resources, uh, you could set a higher number of trials to be run concurrently. Uh, the other one is the max trial count, which is a budget saying this is the maximum number of trials which, which would be run uh, during the experiment life cycle. Uh, the third one is the max fail trial count, which says maximum number of fail trials that I can have uh, during the entire life cycle. Uh, the next is the objective, which says what is my type, whether I have to maximize or minimize. Uh, the objective metric name is the metric that I have to uh, uh, optimize, and the goal is the uh, value that I have to reach. So this actually means I have to maximize validation va accuracy to 99%. And I can actually provide additional metric names if I want to collect extra metrics uh, during the process. Um, the next section is the algorithm section, where I can specify the list of algorithms. Uh, the, some, some are uh, already provided, you could actually add du uh, du uh, during a development process. I could add extra algorithm settings, uh, which would be taken by the algorithm. And the next section is the parameter section, where, uh, as I've told, this is, a, uh, this is a place where you specify the search space. Um, for each parameter, I have to basically say the max and min value, or if it is categorical, I can basically say the list of options that are valid for it. And the last option is the trial spec, which is the most important one, which would be where where uh, you would be specifying what is your uh, the actual job that I have to run. Um, so this is like the one run that uh, that we have run using the Bayesian optimization. So you could see that uh, the final results have um, come to 99%, converged to that. And uh, for each uh, uh, the trial, we, we, we can see that what are the parameters or parameter values that have given to that result. And you could basically say which one, uh, and you can even go backwards and figure out what are the best values that I have to use it. So a little, a little bit more about the, this experiment. So this was conducted using uh, about 100 different trials. And this is using Bayesian optimization. So this is one of the most common algorithms for hyperparameter tuning. Uh, the, the idea is like the previous uh, results of the trials are used to optimize the future results. So given that we have selected some uh, parameter values that have led to a good result, we want to uh, improve upon the, our, our uh, current uh, status. So uh, if you, uh, it's kind of hard to see from this picture, but if you look at the corner there, uh, maybe we started with maybe about 96% accuracy and uh, we were able to improve it to 98, 99%. So, and um, if you uh, click on each of these trials, you actually, you can actually see how the trial progress uh, over time. So the blue line there is the accuracy that uh, has improved, and uh, there's also the validation accuracy. So in this case, we use the validation accuracy as the uh, objective metric. So we use it, use that to determine uh, how good our current set of parameters is. And uh, there, uh, as John mentioned before, uh, there are also ways to collect other metrics. So we can also see how it correlates with, for example, just uh, the accuracy. Okay, so let's go back to you. Yeah. Okay, so I want to bring us back to a broader uh, landscape. Right? So, uh, and this is a problem with uh, classical versus automated machine learning. Um, so, in classical machine learning, a human expert gets involved in a lot of uh, steps, like selecting features, choosing algorithms, configuring hyperparameter values, evaluating performance, tuning models, right? And uh, a general trend that we've seen in uh, computing is that more and more tasks become automated and more and more become uh, delegated to machines rather than having a human getting involved in every step. So 
uh, and this is uh, why we have this uh, research field of automated machine learning, which is uh, having a program generating the model without human intervention and to reduce all of these uh, uh, time consuming uh, steps. So what we've, <coughs> what we've seen is uh, hyperparameter optimization. But in the general landscape, there are also other areas like uh, feature engineering and architecture search. So, and um, I've included a link to a list of uh, all ML papers, and this is uh, uh, just available on GitHub, and it's very, very interesting. So uh, there's something co in common with all of these uh, research, right? So in all the cases, we're dealing with uh, automatically generating a configuration space. So that can include uh, features, hyperparameters, architecture. And in all of these, we generate some kind of a matrix to judge their performance. And based on that, our optimizer algorithm generates a new configuration. Okay. And the output of this is a model, which uh, we can use to serve uh, predictions. So uh, in the recent uh, development, we have uh, expanded CATIP to uh, handle neural architecture search. So this is in contrast to the hyperparameter optimization problem that we just uh, mentioned. And um, the difference is in hyperparameter search, we're only generating values for a list of parameters. So you can think of this as a, a, a vector search. And neural architecture search is a graph search. So the space is uh, exponentially higher than, than, than that of, uh, is, is one dimension higher. Right? And um, there are a lot of research in uh, neural architecture search. So there could be uh, searching for an optimal network, or it could be searching for an optimal cell uh, from which the rest of the graph is generated. And there are also other, uh, th there are also uh, various evolution strategies, such as uh, by generation or by modification. Okay. Uh, so the workflow for uh, architecture search is uh, similar to hyperparameter tuning, except that uh, uh, we still have our objective uh, conditions, like uh, whether we have reached our objective condition or uh, whether we have exceeded our search budget. Uh, but uh, we've also included the uh, constructing the model, because in NNS, the human is no longer uh, the, 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 the human expert is no longer providing the model, right? So what we do is uh, the suggestion will, will generate a list of uh, evolved operations, and from that, uh, we'll generate the next version of the model. And then similar to uh, hyperparameter tuning, we will run these trials based on the model that we constructed and use the uh, metrics to, uh, to using the reporting metrics, we can uh, judge, the, the judge their performance and uh, come up with the next suggestion for the architecture. Uh, so currently, we are supporting uh, envelope net and uh, reinforcement learning for NNS. OK, so we have seen what CATIP has been able to do for now, but uh, what's coming in the future? So uh, first of all, we want to provide better productionization support. Uh, in the architecture diagram, you may remember there's a component for data storage. Uh, this is useful because uh, sometimes you want to store your metrics for uh, ne the next run or maybe to, to, to resume the experiments or maybe just as backup. Uh, but uh, currently, CATIP requires an instance of uh, MySQL to run as the data storage backend. Uh, so one thing we want to do is uh, the, to, to support customizable database. Uh, another thing is uh, metadata integration. Uh, this is uh, in broader scope, and this is a part of the broader uh, Kubeflow uh, team effort. So uh, what we want to do is uh, suppose that you, you've, you've done some hyperparameter tuning experiments and you have, you're able to produce some pretty good results, right? So you want to take those models that you train and serve them, right? So this requires some kind of a generic store where you can uh, store your metadata and to be used by other parts of your machine learning pipeline. Uh, finally, we have uh, supports for other uh, features like long-running experiments. So suppose you have uh, tried to uh, 
some combination of the parameters, but you want to change your algorithm a little bit, maybe change your budget, and uh, you want to see, you want to continue experiments from before. So this this this, this will provide better support for uh, for a hyperparameter service in production. Um, another aspect is, is that uh, we want to add more features uh, relevant to automated machine learning, uh, such as model compression and automated feature engineer. So uh, we've seen that we've seen uh, we uh, how CATF can deal with uh, hyperparameters and neural effective search, search, right? But that has to do with the training process. Uh, the feature engineering will be the step before all this begins. Right? You're selecting your list of features, you're maybe you're doing some kind of feature selection or maybe some feature process or maybe some transformation right, to, to, uh, yeah, to transform your, your training data. And so these are the things that we're uh, constantly researching. Okay, so uh, how do you contribute? Uh, so you can find us on GitHub and um, there will be, uh, feel free to submit uh, feedback, try our service and uh, provide feedback and feature requests. Uh, there will be lots of uh, help wanted features. And um, a great way to contribute would be to help with uh, the infrastructure and testing improvements and uh, maybe adding some new algorithms. So currently we support maybe, f uh, maybe five or six different algorithms. So, and our intention is for Cative to involve into a just open source platform for for the generic um, automated machine learning, right? So we would really welcome uh, contributions. And um, there's an invitation to our Slack channel. Uh, you cannot open it from here, but uh, it's a, if you're interested. Okay, uh, finally, we want to thank a lot of our contributors. Some of them are in the audience today. So NTT, uh, SkyCloud, IBM, Cisco have always uh, been very, very helpful. Okay, so that is it for our presentation, and we will take some questions. Yes. Uh, the Sorry. Can you change the DB backend um, from the current implementation to something else? Yeah. Uh, so currently in V1 Alpha 2, which is the upcom uh, which is a version which is coming in a month, uh, so that's not possible. But in uh, the 0 0.3, uh, the next version, the uh, it will have a pluggable version where uh, you could add any database where and you could just implement the common interface. So the question is about the uh, consumption of resources and Google. Uh, okay. So the question is about the consumption of uh, resources, right? So, uh, so resource you can configure on a per job level, right? So that there are, there are a few ways to config, uh, configure how much a resource you want to consume. So uh, one way is for your your budget, right? So if you if you want to have a smaller parallel budget, you can you can adjust how many trials you want to run in parallel. Right. And uh, another way is to change the sp specifications on the training job. So some training jobs you can use uh, multiple GPUs. Maybe some you can you can reduce the number of GPUs. The question is, do we still need machine learning experts after we have neural architecture search? <laughs> uh, so I, I, th I think uh, a, a lot of uh, research is going into how to efficiently generate uh, neural architecture search, right? So it's not, uh, so a lot of this is still uh, very early, right? So we're still uh, re researching into how to efficiently generate, how to uh, uh, generate uh, 
not not only in, within the limited budget, but also but also make it applicable to various kind of a problem. So I think currently, a newer architecture search is pretty good with uh, just a image recognition, but uh, that there's there's a limited uh, application elsewhere. So so this is still something that still requires research. Uh, thanks for the um, presentation. Uh, so I have a question for for these slides. Do you have a <coughs> do you have a, a simple use case that the um, cat tape can uh, can show that cat tape can um, maybe in which stage that a machine lear learning programmer can can use it? Um, for example, I I wrote a simple training program and I got the um, um, some some model, but I don't uh, satisfy with it, and um, so um, what's the euro um, uh, euro cases that this cat tape uh, product can fit in? So I think uh, uh, I'm not quite clear of this uh, question, uh, this this problem. So, um, um, maybe a, a typical use cases. Um, um, yeah, so uh, so as you described earlier, uh, the wrong settings would actually have a uh, very bad performance of the model, right? So for example, in the demo uh, slide that he has showed, um, if he... Uh, so here, if you see that, for certain parameters, you could see that the the final accuracy has come to um, what's the value here? Uh, just 11 percent. So it actually depends on what. How do you actually figure out what is the best parameter, hyperparameter values for your experiment, right? So here, the the clean advantage that you actually get is you don't need to worry uh, about setting the hyperparameters. You basically get the best hyperparameters that is suited for your model. So as he described earlier, uh, the, mo the model performance continually improves, and finally it gets to 98% in this, in this case. Yeah, I have a very general question for Richard. So from Google's perspe uh, perspective, is Google Flow uh, driven by uh, Google AI or Google Cloud? Your question is about whether uh, the yeah, Google uh, project. Yeah, internal Google, uh, who is driving uh, Google Flow project. Is Google Cloud or Google AI? So uh, it is uh, the Google Flow organization is uh, under the Cloud AI uh, organization. So the, the the team that's driving it is Google Cloud. Google Cloud, OK. Right. Yeah, so I, I, I kind of ha have a feeling that uh, from Google AI, uh, for example, TensorFlow is very hot uh, in the AI domain, but uh, looks like uh, Google Flow is not that popular at this moment. Maybe my, I'm wrong, so maybe you can give me more insight about that. Uh, so our our goal is to democratize AI, and not just uh, targeting uh, TensorFlow. Right. So we want to make it easy for people to build end-to-end -end machine learning workflows on Kubernetes, on just on the cloud. Right. So th that's why the the CATIP and other frameworks are agnostic to the uh, framework. Okay, I see. Okay, thank you. Thanks. Automatic machine learning 有一个小问题 就是我们通过神经网络搜索出来的那个
我们待会儿能私下聊一下。啊，行，谢谢。Okay, so I think our time may be up. Do we have a quick question? Okay. Oh, thank you.